بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. And this medicalization of death, I argue, has robbed humanity, Muslims included, of what has been the most spiritual experience one can undertake in dying. Even Pharaoh called out to our Lord when he was dying. So that's how it's changed. Now I want to bring up some statistics and really lay out the landscape of, of death here in America in 2019 with this first question, how do we die? And this is a pretty pie chart showing the causes of death for people age 65 and older. Heart disease and cancer always being one and two. But I think the more interesting pie chart is this one. At least 70% of older adults will die from chronic illnesses. This means diseases or illnesses that used to kill people over the order of days or weeks are now taking months or years. And I think it's done one of two things to people. Either they take that time to gain some perspective, to plan, right? I know we had a, you had a talk here by my dear friend Yasser Ali about estate planning a few months ago, right? You take this time to plan, draw nearer to Allah. Or I think paradoxically, what has happened is that because we're living so long with chronic illness, we get into a mode of denial where let's say a patient has heart failure and things are looking grim, they get in hospitalized, doctors are great at teeing them up, fixing their medications, discharged home. A couple months later, it happens again. A couple months later, it happens again. So when it finally happens to where it's gotten to a point where the end is near, the patient, the family is in this mode of, no, it's just like last time. You know, the doctor just gave this medication and, and, and she was fine. So we get in this habit of denial and delusion, un uh, unfortunately. The second question is, when do we die? Does anybody want to take a guess as to the average lifespan here in America in 2018? Yeah, yeah, 78.6, and this was 2016. Um, it's fallen a little bit because of the opioid crisis, um, but still 78, good. And if you make it to age 65, that actually increases. So once you make it to age 65, your life, average lifespan is 84.4. And the last question is, where do we die? And I want to spend a few minutes on this. If you're age 65 or older, you have a 27.9% chance of dying in a hospital. 24.7 people die in nursing homes. And 29.4% die at home. Now that 29.4%, I want to just take a minute here. Um, that's increased over the couple of years. Uh, and there's more of a push to die at home. Survey after survey, among older adults, 70%, 80%, when asked where their preferred place of death would be, it's at home. People who are in and out of the hospital, and I'm sure everyone here has had some personal experience to one degree or another. Being in a hospital is not, it's not fun, right? Um, so most people want to die at home when they're asked this. It's this 29.4% is an overestimate, I'd say, for two reasons. Number one, it's not accounting for the transitions at the end of life. What do I mean by transitions? Well, patient is home, then they get admitted to the hospital, spend some time in the ICU, get discharged to a skilled nursing facility, back home, back to the hospital. And if data shows that those transitions have actually increased over the last 10 years, and more and more people are spending more and more time in ICUs in their last three to six months of life. So it's not so much where we spend, where we take our last breath, although that is important. It also big, comes into question where we're spending our last weeks or months of life. Second reason it's an overestimate is like with all medical literature, uh, whites are overrepresented in studies. And we know from smaller studies among minorities, um, minorities are more likely to want to die in a hospital and more likely to die in a hospital. And that's for a couple of reasons. Like, for example, when asking blacks here in America about uh, end-of-life uh, uh, preferences, well, most have a gross mistrust, maybe not most, but a lot have a gross mistrust of the healthcare system founded in historical events. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that blacks 
here in America were experimented on against their own will in Tuskegee, the case of Henrietta Lacks. So there's that gross mistrust. But how about Muslims? What, what are our perspectives? What are our attitudes on end of life care, on these issues? And the short answer is we just, we don't know. There's no, there haven't been any large formalized surveys to actually ask people in our communities what we think. I think as a Muslim, coming from a Muslim family, as a doctor who's treated Muslim patients, um, I think we mirror other minorities in this country, that we push for more aggressive interventions, um, ICU stays, life support, etc. And we'll delve into what truly our, our faith, uh, Islam, says about that, and where we can find some room in our faith to have these discussions. So I want to do a little practice first. Um, I want you to imagine, you are your age right now, whether you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and you start to have a headache, and then some vision changes, and a week goes by and you realize the right side of your body is not keeping up with your left. And you go to the doctor, and the doctor, kind of shocked, she orders a CT scan of your brain. And the CT scan shows that you have what is most likely brain cancer. This brain cancer is the type that, even with surgery, has a 100% recurrence rate, and usually people live on the order of two years with, when diagnosed. And I want you to turn to the brother or the sister next to you. I want you to ask, think about these questions. What are you feeling? What's most important to you right now, and your worries and hopes? And think about what, what is most important for you to do upon hearing this news. So go ahead and take just a few minutes and, 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 uh, and do this practice, inshallah, with whoever's next to you. All right. So usually when I do this in small groups, I actually go around and ask everybody what they've said. But I do want to hear, in terms of what's most important, if anybody, a couple volunteers are like, willing to share what came up in your conversation. Other in the back? A will. Yeah. Inheritance, things like that, taking care that. Mm -hmm. What about? Mm -hmm. so I heard family and dean are big things. Yeah. Anybody else on the sister side? Share? Okay. I've asked this, this question more than a few times, and I think most common things that come up are a bucket list kind of to-do, whether it's traveling or something like that. Family, either spending time with family, mending broken relationships, um, you know, and then all, obviously Dean, like what I'll say, drawing nearer to Allah. A lot of people say Hajj if they're able to, if they haven't done it yet. How many folks said I want to see second, third, fourth opinions from different doctors and seek out the best specialist on brain cancer? We were said, I want to live as long as possible, no matter what, even if machines uh, have to keep me alive. And that's the reason I do this exercise. I've yet to have somebody raise their hand and say that. When we're healthy, we have that perspective. We're going to die, right? We have that perspective in terms of what's important and what our dean teaches us about what's important. But when we're really in that whirlwind, that emotional whirlwind, when we are confronted by illness, a lot of times, those, those things, the doctor's opinions and treatment options and machines, etc., just overload us and overwhelm us. Um, so that's just the practice that I wanted everyone to do. Okay, so now death and dying in Islam, and we'll spend a few minutes on this because I do think it's important. Sheikh Hamza, may Allah preserve him, he, he wrote in his essay, Death, Dying, um, and the Afterlife in the Quran, and I'll read it. Without death, it is questionable whether we would have any need for religion at all. At a fundamental level, religion's greatest claim is making sense of the reality of death, which relentlessly impinges on our living consciousness. This is very true. No one's died and come back to tell us what awaits us. We rely on Allah. We rely on our faith to make sense of it all. So in the Quran, the word al-maut and its versions of it is mentioned 166 times in almost as many verses. And when I looked at these verses, just as an exercise, I looked at what are the most often occurring themes 
in the Quran. Number one is Allahu Yuhyi wa Yumit, right? He is Al Muhyi wa Mumit. He is the sole authority on life and death, the bringer of life, the causer of death. We often use that truth, that reality, as I would call it a cop out almost. Um, we have to make decisions, and Allah is the authority on life and death. That's not mutually exclusive. Allah is our sole authority on our risk, on our provisions. We have a choice whether, when we wake up every morning whether we're going to go to work or not, right? And just like that, Allah is the sole authority on life and death. And He knows what happened, what will happen, what is happening, and what would have happened. But you still have to make decisions. The second oft-occurring theme is um, resurrection, that there is an afterlife. That's because the Arab at the time, they didn't believe in an afterlife. They believed they were mortal. They believed that Allah was the creator. But they didn't believe that they'd be resurrected. That they used to say, they say that there is not but our life in this world. We die and we live and nothing destroys us except time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refutes this time and time again. How can you disbelieve in Allah when you were dead and He gave you life and then He causes you to die and then He gives you life and then to Him is the final return. And Imam al-Haddad rahimahullah comments on this in his Lives of Men. This is the journey of the soul. We need to have this in our minds when we're facing our mortality, right? It is a spiritual experience. And before conception, all of our souls were gathered in Alam al Arwah, where we took the Mithaq, right? The covenant. Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Qalu bala shahidna. Yes, and we are witnesses to that. And we come down to the dunya, the lower world, where we're accountable for our deeds and misdeeds. Go back to Alam al Arwah, where the soul departs. And then finally, judgment day in the final abode. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ridaqa wal jannah wa na'udhu bika min sakhutika wal nar. And then how about the hadith? I want to just take some hadith that the Prophet ﷺ gave us to, to really think about death and dying. First is wisdom. He said, أَكْثَرُهُمْ لِلْمَوْتِ ذِكْرَى وَأَحْسَنُهُمْ لِمَا بَعْدَهُ اسْتِعْدَادًا أُولَٰئِكَ الْأَكْيَاسِ Those who remember death most often and are best in preparing for what's after it, those are the wisest. And I would argue that coming to this talk and preparing for it will classify you as wise by prophetic standards, inshallah. We know that the prophets, alayhum salam, suffered pretty agonizing deaths. The day before he died, sallallahu alayhi, he was wiping his face with cold water, saying, Allahumma ani ala ghabarat al Oh Allah, help me with the throes of death. And also, redemptive suffering is another thing. There was a hadith where one man died and another man said, Hani an lah. He was fortunate. He died without being tried by illness. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he admonished him for saying this. How would you know if, if he wasn't tried by illness that Allah would have forgiven his sins? And I want to take a second here. And, and expiation of sins is something that's very important to us. We know that it's a weak hadith, but a thorn doesn't prick the skin of a Muslim except that he or she is forgiven. But there is a big difference between suffering from illness and causing undue suffering from medical interventions that are around today. There is another hadith, لا ضرر ولا درار. Do no harm nor reciprocate it, nor reciprocate harm. And that is the principal axiom when it comes to Islamic ethics, Islamic bioethics. Do no harm. So there is a, a big difference between suffering from illness and suffering from interventions. And we'll talk about it more later. And lastly is prayer. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu taught us never to long for death, but to ask for life as long as life is good for me. And ask for death if death is good for me. And that's what he taught us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I do want to touch about, spend the next five minutes or so about grief. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grieved when he was confronted by death. When his son Ibrahim was taking his last breaths. The Prophet ﷺ was crying. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, he said, Wa anta ya Rasulullah, and you, O Messenger of Allah, you're crying too? And he said, This is mercy, and started to cry some more. Inna al ayna tadma, where the eye sheds tears, wal qalbu yahzan, and the, the heart is grieved, and we don't say except which is pleasing to our Lord. And then he calls out to his dead son, 
And we are grieved by your separation, O Ibrahim. I want to do another exercise on grief. And this is the five stages of grief posed by psychiatrist Kubler-Ross in her book on death and dying. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. And I'm going to use an example that we know very well to walk us through these stages. And that's of Umar ibn al-Khattab. We know Umar. He was strong, physically strong in his faith and conviction and his love for Allah and his messenger. But when he was confronted by bad news that the Prophet died, he said, some of the hypocrites allege that the messenger of Allah is dead. By Allah, he is not dead has gone to his Lord as Moses went and remained hidden for four, uh, from his people for 40 days. So he's running around with, with his sword out. And what are these stages? He's denying it. He's not dead. He's angry. He's calling people hypocrites. He's yelling. He has his sword out. And of course he's bargaining. He's not, he's not dead. He only went the way Musa السلام, went. Right? And I, I always think you, you, I'm sure everybody here has watched a TV show or a movie where doctor says something like you have cancer and then all of a sudden the patient has this blank stare and they zone out dramatic music and the, the muffled voice of the doctor in the background that's real that happens when people are confronted by bad news but we know the rest of the story where Abu Bakr who finally comes out and he tries to silence Omar twice and he couldn't and finally he did something that was very uncharacteristic of Abu Bakr who he speaks over him and says, whoever worshipped Muhammad know that Muhammad is dead. And whoever worshipped Allah know that Muhammad, Allah never dies. And he said, the ayah, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُولٌ Allah, Muhammad is not but a messenger. Uh, and messengers have passed before him. And reflecting on this, on this moment, years later, Omar says, By Allah, as soon as I heard Abu Bakr recite it, my legs betrayed me so that I fell to the ground. Here's Omar, man, right? We all aspire to be like. Here he is breaking down. And finally he says, I knew then that the Messenger of Allah had indeed died. And he's in, he finally accepted it. I bring this, this, this example for three reasons. Number one is if Omar who felt these emotions, who are we not to? Right? Who are we not to? Number two is Doctors and clinicians don't really do a good job addressing these emotions. We don't. We're just not trained in it. The hospice and palliative care, the fellowship that I am in, takes a whole year to get trained in this, right? So they do a poor job. And usually what happens is we start to try to engage with the patient and their family intellectually. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created aqil. He gave us aqil. That, that separates us from the rest of creation. We have intellect. He also gave us afida. He gave us a fu'ad that's capable of feeling, a heart that's capable of feeling. And as long as the fu'ad is raging with emotion, good luck trying to engage with patients and their families intellectually or cognitively. And then lastly, the way Omar relied on the Qur'an to bring him to that acceptance phase, so should we. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us and will test us. And we need to be patient, inshallah. So now I'll spend the next um, section talking about advanced care planning. But first, I want to introduce what I do um, as a doctor. Does anybody here want to take a stab at what palliative care is? He's the process of dying. So palliative care is a specialty in medicine that focuses, like some of the brothers were saying, focusing on symptom relief and quality of life in patients with serious illness. It is not only end-of-life care. I have patients who are facing serious illness who have just been diagnosed with, with a, like a, a life-limiting illness or a serious illness like cancer, like heart failure, like COPD, and they have tremendous amount of symptoms. I help with those symptoms. It doesn't mean that they are going to die in the next months or what have you. 
Um, they still may be getting curative treatment for their cancer. But palliative care can come at any point in time in a disease process. So when other doctors are introducing palliative care, know that it's not strictly end-of-life care. Hospice care, on the other hand, is. And hospice care is an approach to care for patients where you focus solely on comfort. And usually for hospice care, it is a Medicare benefit. Most patients on hospice are um, at home, although in some specific cases where home is not an option, um, they can be in, in facilities or even in the hospital, although that's rare. And, uh, and really, it's um, a mode of care that, again, focuses on comfort. So those are the differences between palliative and hospice care. There are some overlap, but uh, that's, that's some definitions for you guys. So let's talk about advanced care planning. Advanced care planning is a big umbrella term for planning for the future in terms of your medical decisions. Some other people call it life care planning. I kind of like that better. And a lot of conversations have to happen with advanced care planning, difficult conversations. Three of the, the things that I'm going to address today are something called a surrogate decision maker, something that's been mentioned a couple times already, quality of life. And lastly, code status. Where we have these discussions in advanced care planning, they're often recorded or documented in something we call an advanced directive. An advanced directive is a legal document. This is the easy to read California advanced healthcare directive that you can find on prepareforyourcare.org. I like the easy to read one. And it asks people to go through certain scenarios and to really write down their wishes um, should something happen. But first it asks for the surrogate decision maker. Anybody want to uh, take a stab at what a surrogate decision maker is? Yeah, exactly. Also known as a healthcare proxy, a DPOA of health, durable power of attorney of health. This is someone who can make decisions on your behalf when you are no longer able to. And I would say there are four main things that make a good surrogate decision maker. Number one, they need to know they're a surrogate decision maker. You'd be surprised the patients that I have in clinic, yeah, oh yeah, it's my wife. And then, well, does your wife know that she's going to be your surrogate decision maker should something happen? No, I haven't told her yet. Okay, no, you gotta do that first. I've had patients who thought a family member would be their surrogate decision maker, and the family member said, I, I can't do that. And that's good to know at that point rather than later on. The second thing is that they're available if it's somebody that's really hard to get a hold of, um, probably not a good idea to have them as a surrogate decision maker. Number three is they know your wishes, and we'll talk about what those wishes may look like. And lastly, they need to have the emotional wherewithal to act on those wishes. It could be a very high stress and very difficult situation where they're called to make that decision, and they may feel conflicted making that decision, right? But knowing what your wishes are, they need to make it on your behalf. It's called substituted judgment. So that's what a, a surrogate decision maker is. I want everyone here at least, I mean as a practice, to think who that would be for you. Even if you're young and healthy, you should have somebody in mind and have that conversation. The second thing I want to talk about is quality of life. A lot of times, unfortunately, in this present um, medical arena, quality of life almost as like an afterthought. <laughs> oh, there's nothing to do now, let's focus on quality of life. Uh, I wish that weren't the case. I wish that weren't the case. But when we ask about quality of life, we ask things about what brings people joy. Very common things are being pain and symptom free, being able to communicate with loved ones. And I do a, uh, I'm doing a research study interviewing imams and Muslim chaplains where I ask about quality versus quantity. As a palliative care doc, I want to make you live as well as possible for as long as possible. That's my goal. But a lot of times at the end of life, unfortunately, because of the medical advancements that we have, sometimes quality of life and quantity of life just cannot be addressed together. Um, but when I, ask that, uh, when I ask that to the Muslim chaplains and some of the imams, all of them said quality. They favor quality, in a terminal patient at least. And when I ask what quality is, many of them mention that last piece, the ability to worship Allah. 
having the capacity, the mental capacity to communicate with loved ones, sure, but also being able to carry out ibadah, to carry about worship. And that's very important for us as Muslims. And can, I think, can help contextualize some of the decisions that we have to make. So going to that advanced directive, this is how it kind of looks like. Put an X on this line where you would feel so sick that you may die soon. What do you want to focus on? I want to live as long as possible no matter what, or I want to focus on being comfortable. And then it walks people through specific um, scenarios. And this isn't written in stone. We know that in the medical field, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of gray area. So it just helps as a guide for clinicians who are reading this advanced directive or your surrogate decision maker that are reading this advanced directive to kind of give guidance. So advanced directive, that's, that's, that's important. The next thing I'm going to talk about is code status, which I think uh, as we get older or if we're living with chronic illness is a very important um, topic to discuss and not an easy one. But I want to give you an example of how it's discussed in present day hospitals and medicine. Let's say Mrs. Khan is a 74-year-old woman. And she has diabetes and hypertension, but otherwise she's healthy. And she falls and she breaks her hip. Very common in our, um, an elderly woman. She goes to the hospital, they take her to surgery, they fix the hip, and they discharge her to a skilled nursing facility to get rehab, to get stronger after her surgery. Very common. And in the skilled nursing facility, also very common to get infection. So she comes back to the hospital, to the ER, with a fever, with low blood pressures. She's really sick. And it turns out she has a raging urinary tract infection. And so the doctor comes in, whether it's the emergency room doctor or the admitting doctor at the hospital, asks all these questions. How are you feeling? What are the symptoms? Does a physical exam, runs some tests, and says, Mrs. Khan, we need to admit you to the hospital. In fact, because your, your blood pressures are so low, we have to take you to the ICU for closer monitoring, and we have to give you IV antibiotics. And then they end with this. And we ask this to all patients that are coming into the hospital. If your heart were to stop or you were to stop breathing for whatever reason, would you want us to do CPR or hook you up to life support or allow you to die naturally? That question took me three seconds to ask, four seconds maybe. In my clinic, as a palliative care doctor, this question takes clinic visit after clinic visit, hours to delve into. But we just, in today's medicine, U.S. healthcare, we do not have a system to address this question the way it's supposed to be. So it ends up being a four-second question at the end of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, an intake um, from a doctor. And on top of that, we don't do a good job asking that question. That, the way I asked it, I've learned from trial and error to be, because you got to be quick, because you know you got to get them, and you know they're sick. But you have to be as objective as possible. The way doctors ask it these days is, well, if your heart were to stop, do you want us to do everything we can to bring it back? And of course. Why well, am I in the hospital? Do you want us to take heroic measures to do whatever we can? Yeah. Do you want us to do everything? Of course. So the way we phrase it is obviously um, uh, important. If a doctor feels within herself that so you want a patient to not want that stuff. Sometimes they try to dissuade a patient from doing it. Oh, breaking ribs or traumatic, etc. And I think that's wrong too, right? It takes getting to know a patient and what's important to them. Uh, lastly, I'll say Hollywood does a very bad job at portraying what, what CPR looks like. And there have been studies around this um, in terms of the success rate for, for, uh, for CPR. But the reality is, if you're in the hospital and your heart were to stop, people come in, doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, and immediately begin doing compressions on your chest. And yes, we do break ribs when we do them. Immediately, they we put a mask or a tube down the windpipe to push air into your lungs. Doctors, they, they describe this as helping you breathe. It's not helping you breathe. It's literally pushing air into your lungs, right? And of course, you're getting medications, catheters put in during all this code. It can last anywhere between five minutes to sometimes as long as an hour uh, to see if they're able to get your pulse back. And it can be pretty chaotic, as many times as doctors try to practice it. 
uh, in simulated situations, it's, it's not always that way. And immediately after, they end with a patient, if they're able to get the pulse back, in the ICU. And uh, usually on blood pressure support medications and sedated uh, and or paralyzed. So that's, that's, code, that's what a full code looks like. And I like to spell it out because if you're asking about chemotherapy, you're going to be asking about the side effects and what to expect. And you're also going to be asking about the outcome. How is it going to help? So let's talk about the outcomes. And this is geared towards older adults. Anybody want to take a guess in Hollywood what the success rate is? In Hollywood? 100%. Well, they're not that. Yeah. They've got to make it a little realistic. 75%, okay, according to one study at least. But for our older adults, we know that younger folks may have a better chance at surviving this. For older adults, as we get older or as we get sicker, our chances of surviving just become lower. So if you take 100 people over the age of 65, 49% will die during the actual code. They, wouldn't, they won't survive it. Another 34% will not leave the hospital. Another 7% will die within a year of discharge. 10% chance of, of living after a year of this code in hospital arrest. On top of that, we have this phrase during a code that we say, time is brain. The brain needs a lot of oxygen. And every second, every minute that goes by without adequate oxygen can cause some brain damage. So it's not uncommon that after a code, people can have neurological deficits. And the older you get, the more sensitive your brain is. So this is data showing what your chances are, depending on your age, of what a good neurological outcome or at least just minimal deficits. And as you could see, if you look to the 85-year-olds and older, 4.5% chance, 10% chance of surviving, 4.5% chance of having good neurological outcome. I don't present these numbers to dissuade anybody from being full code. That's not my goal. Uh, I've had patients, elderly patients, who I've had long conversations with, and they tell me, I know what you're saying, doc. I've heard it. I'm going to be full code. So, okay. You've made an informed decision. But I think we do a, a poor job at uh, actually knowing what's out there. So that's why I presented that. Um, for all comers, at least as of 2009 data from anybody who's over 18 years old, for in ho if your heart stops in the hospital, all comers have a 22% chance of leaving the hospital at discharge. So it's not too different from the over 65. But I'd say the thing to take away from this is that you need to have conversations with your doctors, with your loved ones around what you would want. Because a lot of times, this is the last thing that happens to patients before they die. The alternative is what we call DNR, do not attempt to resuscitate, also known as full, no code, also known as allow natural death. And usually it's filled out on this pink form called a pulsed form, physician ordered uh, for life sustaining treatment. And the pulsed form is pink. And the reason it's pink, hot pink, is because it's easily accessible in times of emergency. There have been cases where it's filled out Patients do not want to be resuscitated. But because paramedics can't find it, the defaults, default, the decision's already made for you if you haven't had these conversations, it's to do it. So um, there have been instances around that. Uh, usually I have samples for, for, for you to, to look at, but if you just look at capulse.org, you can see it. It won't pull it up in the, um, in the pink sheet, but it asks three main questions. The first is whether or not you'd like res to be resuscitated. The second is the level of treatment you would like. So whether it's full, everything, including the code, whether it's comfort-based and just everything focused on comfort, and then the selective treatment is somewhere in between. And the last thing it asks is about artificial nutrition and hydration, so tube feeds and the thing, the like. Um, I would say this is very important for anybody who's older to fill out, or at least talk about with their doctor. For anybody who's in and out of a hospital, for anybody at a skilled nursing facility, for anybody with um, serious chronic illness or terminal illness to fill out. This is where we plan. So in conclusion, looking at the, the advanced care planning continuum, you can fill out an advanced directive anytime. It also it talks about now and it also talks about the future. So you can complete an advanced directive, update it periodically. If you are diagnosed with a serious illness, that's when pulsed forms come into play. 
And hopefully the goal is that your treatment wishes are honored. And all the while, of course, you're having these conversations with your loved ones, with your doctors, and everybody involved in your care. A hadith that, uh, that Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam said is, La aqla tadbir. And I think Yasser mentioned this a few months ago when I was watching his live stream. There's no intellect like planning. And so we need to plan. And that's what advanced care planning is about. Okay. So now we'll switch gears again. Actually, let me open it up to questions before I move into the fiqh of end of life care. Um, are, are there any questions that, that come up? I can repeat the questions too. If, yeah. Yes, brother. So the brother asked, it sounds like there's two choices to make, full code versus DNR. And what goes into making that decision? How do you make that decision? And I think it boils down to looking into the future and how you want to live the rest of your life. Knowing really well that if you have terminal illness, if you do have, if you are older, that this may be the last moments of your life. And if at the last moments of your life, you want to allow to, to die naturally without those things, that's one thing. And if you want, there's a lot medicine can do. The question is, should we? So ventilators and ICUs and staying in the hospital, that could last, I'm sure many people here have had experience, weeks to months, even years. Right? A little girl from Oakland passed away after four years of being on a ventilator. So that's the question that, that you need to ask yourself, is how, how important is that for you? Um, and also, there's a degree of suffering that happens during it all, right? Um, is that something you're willing to go through knowing those outcomes? It's a good question, and it's a tough one. There's no legal structure. So as we'll talk about shortly, um, Western bioethics, autonomy and informed consent is the most important thing, meaning doctors will always ask a patient and their families what they want, right, or are supposed to. And so, sorry, I should repeat the question. He's asking if there's any legal, um, uh, I guess, anything legal that's out there that can really determine whether a patient is full code in DNR, specifically in cases where patients are living like with dementia or quality of life may be low. And no, there isn't. Um, so usually they need to turn to patients and their families to make that decision. And uh, if they don't, then the default is to be full code. brother asked if uh, I could speak to um, the responsibility on clinicians and doctors uh, around providing what can be deter like deemed as futile care. Am I saying that right? Uh, I think, I mean, studies have shown that, number one, patients expect their doctors to bring it up, uh, and that even though they're thinking about it, they don't, um, meaning the patients don't. So I do think that it is on the shoulders of clinicians to bring this up. I mean, obviously, I'm doing a talk here in the community to bring it to your radar, but it's just impossible to reach everyone. Most people don't know that these things exist, right, even though it's very important. So I do think that it's the responsibility of a clinician. 
Now to the topic of futile care. That's opening up a whole, whole bag of worms in terms of what's determined as futile and not. Many times um, when patients and doctors are at odds and sometimes doctors feel that distress of providing that futile care, but again, that cloud of emotion prevents or misunderstanding prevents patients' families from really grasping that. Uh, that ethics committees sometimes have to get involved. Um, and some hospitals have structures placed in to carry out if a, if a care, if treatment is futile. It's hard to say how things change. I think the hardest part about all of this is the unknown, right? You just don't know. And doctors can rattle off statistics, but then you'll have, you know, your cousin from New York who flies in at the last moment and says, I had a friend who lived with a coma uh, for three weeks and doctors were ready to pull the plug and then now he's working and he's okay, right? So it's always hard to balance between that um, in these decisions. Did that answer your question? Any other questions before we move on? So talking about Sharia, uh, Imam al-Jawaini, then Imam al-Ghazali, and then finally Imam al-Shaltabi put together the maqasid of Sharia, the objectives of Sharia. And we know that hifz the nafs, the preservation of life, is something very important in our deen. The sanctity of life. We know the verse, whoever kills someone is as if they've killed all of mankind, right? Whoever saved one is as if they saved all of mankind. And we know that the sacred law in most schools can be broken down in terms of our deeds and our actions into these five categories, right? Forbidden, discouraged, permissible, recommended, and finally obligatory. At risk of oversimplifying this, I'm going to take what is now contemporary Islamic bioethicists have, have taken in terms of boiling it down to seeking medical care. Going to your doctor when you're sick. Where does it fall in this continuum? And we'll look at traditionally, there was a small difference of thought. This is just looking at the, when you look at the effectiveness of a particular treatment. When there's any doubt around it or uncertainty around it, what did these con uh, classical jurists say? Hanafi, Malikis, and Hanbalis say that if there's any doubt around the treatment, that it's mubah. Shafi say that it's mandub. And wajib when it's certain, certain. There are very few things that are certain in medicine. I will tell you that wholeheartedly. Uh, but Hanbalis favor, or some Hanbalis classically favor that it's never wajib, and in fact, in some instances, it's uh, preferable that you tawakkal ala Allah. More contemporary scholars came together in the Fiqh Academy in Jeddah in 1992, and they broke it down too. And all four schools were represented. I don't know how many clinicians were involved in these discussions. But they said it's wajib if it leads to disability, death, loss of organ, or if it's contagious. It's mandub if it just leads to weakness. Mubah otherwise. And in fact, it's makruh or discouraged if the complications may outweigh the benefits. Now, that first line, I do have my bones to pick about it because it's never that black and white, right? And I want to highlight this with some recent medical data in one um, study. This study, palliative care doctors love. And what it did, I'll spell it out for you, 151 patients with metastatic lung cancer. If anybody knows about stage four lung cancer, most often you're not living past a year. Your, your prognosis or how long you have left to live is on the order of months. And what they did is they divided these 151 patients into getting palliative care two weeks after diagnosis or not, just regular standard care. And what did they find? Well, not surprisingly, quality of life was better in people with palliative care. Of course, you have a team, you had a nurse and a, and a doctor that focuses on that. That's not surprising. They had better mood scores, so bad, better depression uh, scores with palliative care. Now here's the kicker. Though these patients with palliative care were less likely to receive chemotherapy in the last two weeks of life, less likely to be in the ICU, and more likely to sign on to hospice sooner. They actually lived longer. 11.6 months compared to 8.9 months. And 2.7 months may not sound like a lot to you, 
With metastatic lung cancer, that's a lifetime. If there was a chemotherapy drug that showed 2.7 month survival in this population, you'd be seeing commercials on it, you know, uh, for it on TV. So, again, this doesn't dissuade you one way or another in terms of getting chemotherapy or not. This is to highlight the level of uncertainty we have when we are practicing medicine specifically with terminal illness. Specifically with terminal illness. This is a, <clears throat> a chart that looked at varying councils around the country and across time around withholding and withdrawing life support. These are the answers they gave. Pretty vague, brain death, you, if, you, if useless, persistent vegetative state, a little more specific. If no chance of survival, it's okay or it's not okay. And what is happening here? Who is to say that someone is brain dead or is terminally ill? Well, usually doctors or clinicians are best suited to answer that question. So what we have here is a paradigm where some of our imams and scholars rely on the interpretation from doctors. And doctors practicing medicine here in America will always defer to patients because autonomy is so important. And of course, patients want to know what's okay in, in my deen. This is, this is important stuff. Let's go back to the imams. On top of that, family is very heavily involved in that, that emotion is raging. And it's hard to see past that. And of course, like I said earlier, ethics committees can get involved when it really gets hairy and doctors feel that distress about the care or lack of care that they're providing. This is a messy situation. This is what we want to avoid. This is what advanced care planning hopefully avoids. This is what hopefully this talk and ongoing discussions around this will help avoid. One last uh, ruling that I'll highlight is Saudis. Now, in 1989, Saudi passed a fatwa that said if three competent and trustworthy doctors deem a uh, life-sustaining treatment right, uh, ineffective or inappropriate, then that's, it. that's the process they have. And specifically in the fatwa, it asks, well, what if there's a disagreement between families and, and doctors? Well you do not need to turn to the opinions of the family because it's not from their expertise. It's not their specialty. This will never fly here, right? This is paternalistic medicine. I think that there's something good about this, though, too. So in the 70s and before that, doctors used to be more paternalistic in this country. It swung all the way to the other side. And now it's so much to a point where doctors and clinicians are even afraid to, to present their recommendations. Okay, we have to pray. Um, so I do think that it helps lift the burden a bit, but at the same time, not something we could, that will fly. We could come back for Q&A. There's just a couple more slides um, that we can go through, but I do want us to make Aisha, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. I just wanted to... Um, there are only a few more slides, and I do want to highlight something that's important to bring it really to what's important for us at the end of life. Um, and that's how the Prophet ﷺ died. Does anybody know what Ars Moriendi means? Ars Moriendi translates from Latin into the art of dying. And in the, the, uh, the Dark Ages, a third of Europe third of Europe was decimated by the bubonic plague, or the black plague. And people were dying left and right, and priests from the Catholic Church, who usually served as, you know, the religious figures to help those who were dying spiritually, could not keep up. So they made this manual called, called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying, in terms of what's important for a Catholic or a Christian when they were dying. And I challenge us as a community, hopefully, to really focus on what the Prophet ﷺ taught us and how he died and what's important. And I didn't formalize this or anything. This is just me reading through it and, and kind of the important things that came up. Number one is the acknowledgement that he was dying When he sent Mu'ad bin Jabal عنه, to Al Yemen, he said, I love you. And then he said, you won't see me in the next year. The next time you come back, you'll be visiting my grave. 
He acknowledged that he was dying. The whole khutbatul wada, the farewell sermon, was him saying goodbye. So that was important. Number two, this is the preferred place where he wanted to die. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was at Maymuna radiallahu anha's his house when he first got the fever. When he gathered his wives at the end, said, where shall I stay? And they all knew he wanted to stay with Aisha radiallahu anha. And that's where he stayed. So a, prefer, a preferred place of dying is in the sunnah. Legacy and charity. Whether it was pointing Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to lead prayer when he was too ill to get up. Or the day before he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, what do we have in this house in terms of his money? It was seven dirham, which is equatable to $20 today, is what they say. And he'd fall back out of consciousness. He'd wake up, he'd say, well, go and give it to the poor. Go and donate it to the poor. Fall back in, out of consciousness, wake back up. And he kept doing it till Sayyidina Aisha anha knew that this was something so important that he wouldn't let go until it happened, and so she did. So charity being important. Communication with loved ones. On his last day, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when his daughter Fatima radiallahu anha came in, and he whispered in her ear, and she started crying. Then he whispered in her ear again and started laughing. And what did he say to her? He said that father will no longer be here the first time, so she started crying. And then he gave her the news that she will be the first among his family to join him. So she started laughing. This communication with loved ones was important. Rituals. On the last day, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man from Abu Bakr's family came in and he had a miswak on his person. Aisha anha being the wife that she was, she, she saw that the Prophet وسلم, was focusing on this miswak. She knew she, he wanted it. So she took it, she moistened it in her own mouth and gave it to the Prophet. And she recounted the story as him brushing with the miswak with more energy and vigor than he had ever done before. And lastly, autonomy and decision making. That's how we translate it in, into present day terms. But when he was in and out of consciousness, by some narrations it was al Abbas, by other narrations it was his wives, forced medicine in his mouth, or something called pleurisy. And he woke up upset, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and said, well, how would you like it if I forced this in your mouth? On top of that, we know when he was on the minbar the last time, and he said, Abdun khayyarahu Allah, أن يؤتيه زهرة الدنيا بين أن يأتيه زهرة الدنيا وبين ما عنده فاختار ما عنده. It was a servant among the servants of Allah who Allah had given the choice, the luxuries of this dunya or that which is with Allah, and he chose that which is with Allah. And Abu Bakr started weeping. And all the Sahaba were concerned. I mean, why? Why are you weeping? And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he knew that the Prophet sallallahu was talking about himself. And his last words were what? Al-Rafiq al-A'la, Al-Rafiq al-A'la. The highest companionship. And that's because we know that the angel of death asks the prophets, alayhum as for permission before taking their souls. And the Prophet sallallahu was uttering his choice. That autonomy and decision making is part of the sunnah. And if there were any more blessed place to die than in the, in the arms of your wife at home, the Prophet Wasallam would have died that way. And I, I hope through this talk that we start to reclaim the dying process as Muslims. We are up against a lot, right? What our community, what our society values in terms of medicine and medical care. But there is something to be said. There is room for us as Muslims to reclaim that narrative and make it so that the people in our community that are inevitably faced by their mortality have something to turn to. Again, Jazakumullah khair for coming. I hope, um, I hope you've gained something from this talk. If you want to hang around and ask me questions or more importantly, give me feedback. Uh, I give this talk. Uh, it's only been a few times so far. 
things you liked, things you didn't like, things you wish you saw more of or less of, um, would be very helpful for me. So, Jazakum Allah